أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا ولما رأى المؤمنون الأحزاب قالوا قالوا هذا ما وعدنا الله ورسوله وصدق الله ورسوله وما زادهم إلا إيمانا وتسليما من المؤمنين رجال صدقوا ما عاهدوا الله عليه فمنهم من قضى نحبه ومنهم من ينتظر وما بدلوا تبديلا ليجزي الله الصادقين بصدقهم ويعذب المنافقين إن شاء أو يتوب عليهم إن الله كان غفورا رحيما ورد الله الذين كفروا بغيظهم لم ينالوا خيرا وكفى الله المؤمنين القتال وكان الله قويا عزيزا وأنزل الذين ظاهروهم من أهل الكتاب من صياصيهم وقذف في قلوبهم الرعب فريقا تقتلون وتأسرون فريقا وأورثكم أرضهم وديارهم وأموالهم وأرضا لم تطؤوها وكان الله على كل شيء قديرا بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين We indeed praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon all conditions No matter what we are going through in life We will continue praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala For indeed He is the giver of the life in the first place He is the one whom we shall return to when we ultimately do die May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our living easy and may he make our death easy. May he make our return to him easy and may he be pleased with us. We send blessings and salutations upon all the messengers who were chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deliver his message to us. The reason why we send blessings and salutations to all of them, which includes the prophets from the very beginning, Adam alayhi salam, Going all the way down, the Prophet Noah, may peace be upon him, Abraham, Ibrahim alayhi salam, and coming down all the way to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, including Jesus, may peace be upon him. The reason why we send blessings and salutations upon them, we as Muslimin are taught to appreciate goodness that has come in our direction. These were the ones who have actually been chosen by Allah. They came to us in order to remove us from darkness and bring us to the light in order to show us the path. They were the messengers who carried the message. So it would be an insult for us to hear their names and not to say, may peace be upon them. In the same way, they brought the peace to us. If we follow their messages, we will achieve peace. This is what Islam means. Islam means peace. 
You and I know it stands for peace. And at the same time, that peace we are asking that Allah bestow upon those whom he chose to bring it to us as a means. Now I hope you understand one of the reasons why we continue to say may peace be upon him, may peace be upon them, etc, etc. So we send blessings and salutations upon all of them, more so upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam being the final messenger. The one who taught us to honor all of the previous brothers of his who were messengers. When I say brothers, I'm talking of brothers in prophethood. Brothers in the fact that Allah chose them all to deliver the goods to us. So this is why he is the one whom we follow as he is the final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding of this beautiful religion. When people created cartoons or drew those cartoons against Jesus, may peace be upon him, we were insulted as Muslimin more than the Christians. The reason is we truly follow him. We truly follow Jesus, may peace be upon him. For us, love is not just to sing a song, but love is to live your life in a way that you would actually be able to follow the example of that person. When you're married or when you have a child, if you were to say, I love you, I love you, just by your mouth, it's not enough. You cannot just say, I love you by your mouth, but you are disobeying your parents. For example, you do everything to spoil your children. You are saying, I love you, and yet it's only a statement by the mouth. We are taught that when you say, I love you, it is actually a dedicated commitment saying that I definitely would fulfill your rights to start with. And I would ensure that you are taken care of and you are not saddened unless it is for the wrong reason. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. So when we say we love the Prophet Jesus, may peace be upon him, we live our lives in a way that we would not go against his teachings. Amazing. I recall when I entered a school, a primary school in one of the rural areas in Zimbabwe, they looked at me and they said, Jesus has come. Subhanallah. <laughs> Jesus has come. And I was like, wow, imagine myself being a Muslim. It's an honor for them to even think that I look similar to someone I haven't seen. They are the ones who draw those images, not me. I didn't ever say that. I haven't seen a picture drawn by the Christians of Jesus without a beard. Nor have I seen a picture of Mother Mary without a long gown, a long dress, subhanallah. So those who dress like Jesus and Mary are actually the Muslims, subhanallah. It's amazing. So although I had said to them later on that what we believe about Jesus, may peace be upon him, is a little bit different. That's not my topic today. But I started off in this way because I want you to know we appreciate goodness no matter where it comes from. We are Muslims. We show kindness to entire creation of Allah. If you can achieve heaven through quenching the thirst of a dog or being kind to a cat, what about other human beings? Remember that. If you can achieve heaven through quenching the thirst of a dog or you can achieve forgiveness through quenching the thirst of a dog and you and I know the level of a dog in Islam whereby if it were to lick you, you need to wash yourself in a certain way. You know that. But still, you know that a person, according to the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu went down a well in order to actually get some water and he came up, he drank a bit of the water. When he came up from the well, he saw a dog. The dog was panting and the dog was very thirsty, dying of thirst. He told himself, I was so thirsty, I quenched my thirst. This dog is as thirsty as I was. Let me assist, let me help, let me go down again and fill my own shoe with water. Bring it up and let the dog drink. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that as a result of that act of compassion, that particular individual was forgiven. Forgiven. I want to ask you, my brothers and sisters in faith, in Islam, if that man was forgiven because he was compassionate towards an animal, that animal not being a little kitten, not being, you know, something sweet like, like a bird, a parrot, etc. But a dog, you know, a dog, depending on how you say it, it can actually be a swear word. If I say doggy, doggy, it might be, you know, people might like it. But if I say dog, what happens? People don't want to be called dogs. So it goes to show that 
That particular animal selected, if Allah wanted, it could have been anything else. But this person achieved forgiveness through showing compassion to that dog. What about the rest of mankind? What about those who are human beings before they are Muslim, human beings? And then what about those on top of that who happen to share your faith? Today, let's face facts. We are not fulfilling our roles in society and community because we don't even understand where we belong. We don't even understand our duties. One of the first things you need to know if you want to fulfill your role in society, in community, your role as a Muslim for your nation, for the entire Ummah, for the world at large, you need education. You need to know. You need knowledge. What is it? A lot of people don't know what Islam is. They think that Islam preaches hatred. Islam preaches the fact that you don't ever talk to the non-Muslims. You don't serve them. You don't ever look in their direction. You spit in that direction. If that's the case, that's not Islam. You who are seated here, is that what you know? Not at all. We are taught to reach out to people because at some stage in our lineage, we were not Muslims. We were not Muslims. You were not Muslims. A few generations back, someone came they worked hard on your forefathers or on you if, you're, if you accepted Islam in your life, on your parents or forefathers, they had a concern, they fulfilled their role. And that is why we ended up somewhere up the ladder, forefathers or ourselves saying, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. I bear witness, there is none worthy of worship besides my maker. And I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is his messenger, final messenger. So in the same way, we need to reach out to the others who are outside. When you look at them, you look at them as potential Muslims. You look at them as people who perhaps we need to reach out to for them to at least know what Islam is all about. More so today when the media is presenting the wrong image of Islam. When the media is presenting the wrong image of Islam. So my brothers and sisters, what we need to know is without knowledge, without education, we're not going to be able to move a step forward. This is why in Revelation, one of the first words, in fact, the first word revealed to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was connected to something very important. If Allah wanted, it could have been something else. You know, when Jibreel Alayhi Salam met Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the cave for the first time, giving him nubuwa, meaning giving him nubuwa, prophethood. What was the first word? Iqara, read. He was an honest man, honest enough to say, you know what? I'm not a reader. I can't read actually. Read again. I'm not a reader. I can't read. I'm not, you know, lettered, so to speak. And Jibreel alayhi salam recited the verses, Iqara bismi rabbika alladhi khalaqa. Read in the name of your Lord who has created. From this I learn the importance of reading and the fact that nothing is impossible if you have the help of the Almighty. He said, I cannot read. Jibreel says, well, in the name of your Lord, you will be able to do much more than reading. Allahu Akbar. So he was a Nabi of Allah. We cannot say he was uneducated. That word is insulting. We cannot say he was illiterate. Perhaps that word also some may consider derogatory. What we do say is he was unlettered, but he was highly educated. He was so knowledgeable. A few minutes ago, we heard Sheikh Muhammad speak. And what did he say? Biology, sociology, physics, chemistry, everything you find in the Quran. Who came with it? The same man who said, Ma ana biqari. The same man who said, I'm not a reader, but this was in the, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is something unique that we need to think about. If you are not prepared to read, if you are not prepared to make an effort to learn, wallahi, you won't be able to understand why you are in this world. A lot of people don't know. A lot of people don't have a clue why they are on earth. They don't know because they've never read. And Allah has made it easy for us. Allah has made it easy for us. He knows that we are lazy. As time passes, guess what? We're becoming more and more lazy. My grandmother perhaps used to get up and plow the fields in the rural areas. My mother used to get up and feed us. My mother used to get up very early 
and she used to actually spend the whole day working hard she slept the last one and she was up the first one but this generation i don't want to say my sisters because that's not true but i want to say i fear that my children they should not be from amongst those who get up at 10 o'clock in the morning and they are the last people to worry about anyone else we've become lazy why we don't understand our roles in society in my family i don't know my role get up it's not all about sleeping please and i can tell you what the problem is it goes beyond sleeping perhaps you're too long on your phone or too long in front of the television at night so you cannot get up your body needs seven to eight hours sometimes a minimum of six below six i think is unhealthy so if you are to sleep sleep on time the prophet muhammad peace be upon him taught you that he says those who don't have anything better to do after Salatul Isha, the hadith now speaks about how important it is after Salatul Isha to go to bed, go and sleep. Unless you're worshipping Allah, unless you're doing something beneficial, if it's not, go to bed. If you don't, you will pay a heavy price for that. I am saying this. What is the heavy price? You won't even be able to get up in the morning to, in order to honor your Lord, your Lord with Salatul Fajr. May Allah forgive us every time we've been lazy. But because Allah knows we're becoming lazier, if I were to ask you all now to tell me honestly, honestly, with a show of hands, how many of you have read an educational book from cover to cover in the last month put up your hand mine is down notice mine is down i'm not i'm honest i can count less than 10 hands in this whole stadium right mashallah one thing i learned we are honest in nigeria alhamdulillah alhamdulillah we didn't need to prove a point and mashallah i do know there are people who are readers they read but I am, I've just proven a point that we be, we've become lazy. But I want to ask you, how many of you have listened to a lecture online? Put up your hands in the last three weeks. Most of us. Thank you. The point is Allah has now given you different ways of learning. Did you hear that? If you're lazy to read, Allah says, okay, listen to a CD. Oh, the CD is a bit boring. Okay, watch it on, on television. Oh, I don't have. Okay, check it on the internet. Okay, watch the DVD. You don't have an excuse. You don't have the DVD. Turn on the radio. Subhanallah. You're driving. Switch off the music. Turn something on that will be beneficial. You will learn character, conduct. Primarily, you're going to learn why Allah created you. Why? I asked a question years back. Why am I created? Number one. And number two is, why am I going to die? Why? And number three is, why is everyone on earth suffering? Even the rich, they are suffering. They have something which is difficult. And the answers came in the Quran. Allah says, I have created you to test you. I have created you so that you can obey me, so that you can worship me. Very interesting verse. People won't understand it initially. Allah says, I've only created mankind and jinn kind in order that they worship me. That's your first role. I worship Allah. I worship Allah alone. So if you take a look at that, one might say, does that mean I need to engage in prayer 24 seven? Does that mean I need to be reading the Quran? I need to, you know, praise Allah 24 seven. The reality is what that means is you need to lead your life in a way that goes in accordance to what your Lord has dictated to you through revelation. So I need to know revelation and I need to lead my life. I will enjoy my life, but in a way that the Almighty has taught. And this is why the closer you are to your maker, wallahi, the more content and happy you are on earth, even though you may be facing worldly difficulties, but you're a happy person. We all have challenges. You look at those who seem to be so happy. A lot of the times it's to do with their belief. They are happy because they have Allah. They are happy because they are close to their maker. They are happy because they've disciplined themselves according to what Allah has wanted from them. They haven't just done things as per their own whims and fancies. When you want to fulfill your lusts, 
your desires, when you become immoral, when you want to lure people into sin, when you start stealing, when you start cheating and deceiving, when you want to be proud over others, I promise you, it comes at a price. What is the price? The very happiness you are running after, you do not get. It is snatched away from you because happiness is towards this direction and you are running in the opposite direction. Allah is telling you, you want to be happy? Well, work as hard as you can in the world. Work hard, you will earn. Whatever you can afford, you will get and so on and so forth. There will be so many things that will be of benefit to you, but don't transgress. The Prophet Muhammad explaining to us, he says, If I have prohibited you from something, stop it. Don't do it. And if I've instructed you to do something, do it as best as you can. What an amazing teaching. Learn to fight the devil when he comes to whisper, because that is part of your test. That is part of your test. You know the answer. You know when you have a multiple choice examination, you look at it one plus one. A equals two. B equals three. C equals 11. D equals 12. And E equals 13. And you just have one plus one. In your mind, you know the answer. It is A. Agree? I don't need to think about it. But shaitan comes to you and says, no, no, hang on, hang on, hang on. You know what? It's too easy. This question is too easy. You are writing a very, very big A-level examination. There is a catch. There is a catch. You start thinking there must be a catch. Why? Because I'm too clever. This examination is for grade one. How can they ask one plus one in an A-level exam? Well, they have. So now you start thinking, did you need to think? No. Who made you think? Shaitan. But you know the answer. And after a while, you cross off where it says 11 because you think one and one. So you cross off where it says 11 and you carry on. What happened? You got the answer wrong. I promise you, you will kick yourself when you go and see the result. You say, I knew the response. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, we know where contentment lies. We know where the pleasure of Allah lies. We know it as simple as ABC and as simple as one plus one. But you know what we do? We still prefer to be conned by the devil that when you commit adultery, you're going to be happy. The devil allows you that excitement for five minutes, 10 minutes, for a day, two days, for a month, two months. After that, all hell breaks loose, as they say. What happened? Was it worth it? It was not worth it. But I was rich. I could afford it. I had so many, you know, people that I claimed I loved. But in actual fact, I was just fulfilling my lusts and desires. What happened? Your life is destroyed. You lost your family. You lost your children. Everyone went away. Why? I did not fulfill my role as a father of the home, as a husband. I didn't fulfill my role as a wife. I was not patient enough with my family members. Be proud of your children and your family members. When I say proud here, I'm talking of happiness coupled with that which it comes with humility. I'm not talking of the haram pride known as kibr in Islam or in Arabic. We are too embarrassed sometimes to acknowledge this is my child. Just because she's darker than the other ones. Allahu Akbar. What did you do? You have failed your test. You have really failed your test. You don't even know what the role of a mother is, if that is the case. If you're talking about yourself as an individual, who are you? Ask yourself, am I a son? If I am, I need to fulfill my role as a son or a daughter, a child. Am I a parent? If I am, yes, I need to fulfill my role as a parent. A lot of us are parents, but we are still busy sinning. We are doing things we would never want our children to do. Wallahi. Please think about this. That is why society is crumbling. We are parents. We have children, but we are not ashamed. We are doing deeds that really we would not want our children to do. This is shocking. And not one or two. It's a trend. Take a look at adultery. Would you like your child to do that? Take a look at gambling, lying, cheating, drinking, drugs clubbing, whatever else there is to commit in terms of sin. 
We would not want our children to do that. We have children, but we are still doing it. What do you expect? May Allah forgive us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala strengthen us. You want that happiness. You want to improve the image of Islam across the globe. Wallahi, you need to develop closeness to Allah. That's what it is. You need to worship him alone and understand when you get close to Allah, your heart becomes soft. You become lenient with others. You become a person who fulfills the rights of others. That's what it is. You become a person who looks at others and who tells himself they are also creatures of the same maker. Allahu Akbar. They are creatures of the same maker. Who made you? Allah. Who are you going to go back to? Allah. Who made them? Allah. Who are they going to go back to? Allah. You are one family, the family of mankind. The difficulty with us, we only think it's we are the ones who are entitled. We are the ones I have. I'm worried about myself, my pocket, my goodness, my happiness to the degree that I'm not even bothered about those who are in my family. We cannot resolve matters and problems because there is pride that has overtaken us. So it all depends on who you are. If you are a leader in community, an imam in the masjid, for example, Wallahi, you need to lead by example. Yes, you are a human. You are not a Nabi. You are not a prophet. So you need to know people look up to you. Try your best to lead a life of an example to others. Exemplary. That which when people see, they will definitely say, this is a religious man. This is a teacher. This is a preacher, for example. And his life is led exactly as he speaks. That is when you will succeed. But if you are teaching others goodness, if you are trying to help people in their faith and yourself, you are not bothered about what you are teaching, that hypocrisy will catch up with you at some stage. May Allah forgive us. If human nature makes you fall, seek the forgiveness of Allah and seek the forgiveness of those whom you have hurt. I repeat, if human nature makes you fall, seek the forgiveness of Allah and seek the forgiveness of those whom you have hurt or you have wronged. For indeed, in that way, you will be able to achieve. But don't let it become a habit. You know, when I speak to married couples who are suffering a bit of turbulence and the wife is complaining that this man, he oppresses me, he hurts me, he is very abusive and he commits this sin and that sin and he is, you know, womanizing and whatever else. I normally ask a question, is it a habit or is it a one off sin? Remember, that's a very important question. Is it nature or is it a one off sin? If the man or the woman has fallen as a one off sin, perhaps human nature made them fall. But if it's a habit, then they haven't understood their role in the family. Perhaps it will become more difficult. So there is a different way of resolving a matter when it was a one off sin. And there is a different way of resolving the matter when it becomes a habit. A habit. A person is in a habit of committing a sin. That is their life. It becomes their nature. In that case, we might deal with it a little bit more aggressively. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us and help us. Amen. We as human beings need to develop ourselves. Eradicate your bad habits. Are you ready? Are you ready to tell yourself today, here and now, what your bad habits are? and the fact that you are going to get rid of them? Are you ready? You know your bad habits. Are you ready to tell yourself, this is my habit, I'm lazy. When I speak, I don't think, I hurt people. I hurt people, even though I think I don't hurt them. Maybe I should say that to the men. I hurt people without thinking. I've heard a lot of men speak very rough very rough thinking that they are entitled but the sad part is i've heard a growing number of women do the same may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us let's not do that if you want to build a beautiful community watch your tongue you know when you get married i'm sure you know khutbatul haja is actually read right which is a certain a few passages of the quran Allah says, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu attaqu allaha wa qoolu qawlan sadeeda. O you who believe, be conscious of Allah. And only utter that which is upright. Only say that which is upright. Why does that verse 
become so important when we are officiating a marriage. Because 90% of your problems in marriage are actually connected to the way you use your tongue. 90% of the problems in marriage are connected to the way you use your tongue. So be careful. If you do not use your tongue correctly, perhaps it will result in your marriage breaking. It can. Many people don't use their tongues in the proper manner. Hence, they break relationships. So think of your bad habit and eradicate it. Promise yourself here and now, this is my bad habit. I'm definitely going to do away with this. I'm definitely going to help myself. And each one of us has different habits that are bad. Sometimes we are tested when we are upset, when things don't go the way we want them to go. We are tested. What do you do? Do you become angry? Do you start blaming others? Do you start shouting and screaming? If that's the case, you need help. You need a lot of help. You need a lot of help. So my brothers and sisters, let's try and understand. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with the message of Islam. I want to spend a few moments telling you about the rights of the non-Muslims. The rights that you owe those who are not Muslim. The reason I want to say this is many people have become very indifferent or sometimes you find other people who become violent in the name of Islam. The problem is not just with the way we treat non-Muslims, but even within ourselves, those whom we differ with. Do we need to beat them up? No. We need to talk to them. We need to, we have the right to discuss. We have the right to express and explain. We have the right to say things. They have the right too to explain to us why they believe what they believe, why they are saying what they are saying. They have the right, they are human beings. You cannot say you don't have the right to talk. I do. If someone has a confusion, how are you going to clarify that confusion if they don't speak? So it's your duty to let them speak so that you can clarify and don't become aggressive. Educate. Many people are ready to follow what they are convinced is the truth. But we are not ready to convince them. We don't have the patience to talk to them. We become impatient. And when we're impatient, we become hostile because we are impatient. But if you have the patience, you try once, you try twice, you try three times, you try four times, and then you realize guidance is in the hands of Allah. Take a look at Abu Talib. Who was he? Abu Talib was the uncle of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He didn't accept Islam, but he was sympathetic towards the cause. He was sympathetic to the degree that he did not allow people to harm his nephew. He didn't. And he knew what was right. So the Prophet sallallahu tried with him once, tried with him twice, tried with him countless times, but did not become angry or upset. Never. The Prophet sallallahu on the deathbed of Abu Talib says, Ya Ammi, قُلْ كَلِمَةً أُحَاجُّ لَكَ بِهَا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ Look at the beautiful words. Oh my uncle. Now this was the last try. Oh my uncle. Say this statement, this declaration. Say this word. And I will fight your case on the day of judgment. But the uncle did not say the word. What happened? The Prophet ﷺ, did he become angry? No, he became sad. He was saddened because he felt he was the messenger. He had to deliver the message. And here is someone so close to him not accepting the message. Did he become violent? No. Did he start beating people around there? No. Did he swear anyone? No. He was so sad that he called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result of which the verses were revealed comforting him. Don't be sad. Guidance is in our hands. <laughs> you do not guide whomsoever you wish, but Allah is the one who guides whomsoever he wishes. It's Allah who's the guide, not you. So Allah told Muhammad 
We are the ones who give the guidance. In another place of the Quran, Allah says, Your duty is to convey the message. Our duty is to take account. To take account of what they've done. The message came to you. What did you do? You just deliver the message. How they respond to the message is between them and us. The same applies to anyone speaking good, anything good. Today, I'm speaking to you. I will be asked, you spoke to them. What about your own life? You spoke to them. Do you practice what you preach? That's what I will be asked. And you will be asked, you heard the message. Did you practice upon the good that you heard? Did you practice upon the good that you heard? If the answer is yes, my life changed. I changed my life. I did good. I came closer to you, O oh Allah. I became a better person. I became more bothered about how I speak so that I can fulfill my role in a better way. When you're a manager or when you're a CEO of a, of a big company, you know that the way you speak to people means a lot. You know that those who are under you perhaps and you are in authority over them, they are motivated by good words. They are not motivated by you screaming, yelling, swearing, insulting, not at all. I know as a person who preaches and who tries to motivate that when you want to speak to the new generation, you have to be one of them. You cannot stand and preach in a way that they feel this is a person from out of space living somewhere where they don't even understand what we're going through and instructing us to give up our lives. May Allah forgive us. But when you understand them, when you relate, when you respect people, when a person sins, the idea is not to insult them, but it is to help them so that they stop sinning. A lot of us, someone sins, we go around the whole city informing the whole globe that this person committed adultery. Sometimes it's not even the case. Gossip, we love it. We enjoy it. Gossip will destroy communities, societies. Why don't you say good things behind their backs? Why don't you say good things behind their backs? That is how you will build society. I remember speaking in a community where they were complaining about their mothers-in-law. Now, I hope that that is not a problem here. But you know, anywhere you go in the world, sometimes you will have a few issues here and there. People complaining about their mothers-in-law. And I said, one of the solutions is to say good things behind her back about her in a way that she gets the news from someone else that your daughter-in-law only says good things about you. What will happen? Even if she says bad things, she will be ashamed. And vice versa. Vice versa means my beloved mothers-in-law, when you speak about your daughters-in-law, only say good things. Wow. Only say good things and you see what will happen. Say, mashallah, she's a very, very good wife to my son. She is. My son loves her a lot. Alhamdulillah. She greets me. She comes here once a year for 15 minutes and that is a lot. Mashallah. Subhanallah. Notice what I'm saying. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May He open our doors. The difficulties we face, my brothers and sisters, a lot of the times connected to the fact that our salah is not in order. One of our primary duties is to fulfill our prayers to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's given us our lives. What do we do? We didn't fulfill the salah. We felt lazy when we did it. We lived a life where when people watched us, our children or family members, they saw that whatever the Almighty had ordained was actually considered a burden upon us. We didn't want to do it. We dressed. But we didn't want to dress the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us to dress. We kept on revealing more and more. Wallahi, those who have revealed, those who have revealed, let me tell you what happens to them. Those who don't want to dress according to what their maker has dictated. And I'm not just talking about Islam. This applies to the Christians and the Jews as well. They also have very strict code of dress. If they've forgotten it, it's not our fault. Like I said earlier, we dress more like the Mother Mary than the Christians themselves, with all due respect, obviously. But what I want to tell you today is those who want to show they become enslaved 
by what other people think about them. They live a life that's not happy. I know people who put makeup on their knees. I know people who wear makeup on their knees in order to hide the fact that the knee is darker than the rest of the leg or they have stretch marks on the knee. Why? Because they want that miniskirt to look such that when people see woo -hoo, woo, those legs, but you don't realize you cannot go to Rukur or Sujood, you cannot touch it and if anyone touches it, you are depressed. May Allah forgive us. I know people who wear makeup not just on their faces, but Astaghfirullah, even to show a cleavage, Astaghfirullah. Is that what we are supposed to be doing? Is that goodness? Is that happiness? Be yourself. Allah has given you whatever you have. Be yourself. Learn to love yourself for who you are. Wallahi, you will be able to lead a much happier life and you will be able to guide others towards that happiness. Be yourself. Be happy with what Allah has bestowed upon you. Wallahi. That is something very important. It is the teaching of Islam. Allah tells us, appreciate what we've given you. This is why Allah says, you have hair a certain way, be happy with it. You have a complexion a certain way, be happy with it. If you are like me and you don't have hair on your head, be happy with it, mashallah. Bald already, mashallah. And someone was calling me youth a few minutes ago, mashallah. Well, we are. Everyone feels young, don't they? So my brothers and sisters, the duties we have unto Allah, fulfill them. That will guide you to fulfilling the duties that you have upon the rest of mankind, starting with your own family members. The Prophet ﷺ constantly repeated the importance of being good to family members. They are a test. Why a test? Allah chose who your father is, who your mother is, etc. Allah chose. The Prophet, peace be upon him, speaks about kindness to women. And he says, Khayrukum, khayrukum li ahlihi. You want to know who are the best from amongst you? Who is the best from amongst you? The best from amongst you, those who are best to their wives and family members. Why? Because your wife sees you 24 seven. If she can bear witness that you are an honorable man, then indeed you are honorable and vice versa. You live with her, so she knows. But for others who only see you for a short time during the day, or a little, a few hours, you can act. You can be nice to them as an act, but you're not a nice person. Go home, have CCTV in your home and let those whom you work with see how you operate in your own home. They probably won't want to talk to you. But Allah has CCTV far more sophisticated than what we know. Our interpretation of CCTV, Allah is watching, Allah sees. When you enter your home, an act of worship is to smile. How many of us do that? When you enter your home or when a family member enters the home, you smile, subhanallah, act of worship. That's why Allah said, we created you to worship us. It's an act of worship. It's amazing, it's unique. It's something Allah has given you as a favor. He says, when you smile, it's an act of worship. When you sit and have a meal with your children and guide them, talk to them, try to help them, it's an act of worship. You are fulfilling your duties, subhanallah, act of worship. When you enjoy an intimate moment with your spouse, it is an act of worship. Why? Because it is your spouse. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they were told by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, something very unique. You know what he said? وَفِي بُضْعِ أَحَدِكُمْ صَدَقَةً Wow! You know what that means? In the act of intimacy, to fulfill that act of intimacy with your spouse is an act of worship. Whoa! Subhanallah! The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they were obviously, they wanted to ask a question now. You know, أَيَأْتِ أَحَدُنَا شَهْوَتَهُ وَيَكُونُ لَهُ صَدَقَةً According to some of the words, they asked, O oh Messenger, peace be upon him. You mean we fulfill our desire? You mean we fulfill our desire? We engage in an act of intimacy with our spouses. 
And that can be an act of charity. It can be an act of worship. Now in order to answer that, the Prophet ﷺ says, well, if a man did it in a haram way, would he get a sin? Would he be sinful? If a man fulfilled his desires in a wrong way, in an adulterous way, would he be sinful? They said, yes, he would. Well, if he did it in the right way, he would achieve a reward. Allahu Akbar. Look at how blessed the educational system is in Islam. If you did it the wrong way, you would get a sin. If you do it the right way, you get a reward. And guess what? Shaitan does not want you to get a reward. So he starts beautifying that which is not yours to you. In order that you start sinning in the same way that he makes you lazy to fulfill salah. Same way. He uses the same tricks to make you do something that is prohibited so that you earn the wrath of the Almighty. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. May He strengthen us. And the minute sin starts becoming prevalent in society, forget about that society. When sin becomes prevalent in society, do you know what will happen? Society will crumble because primarily they don't have the pleasure of Allah. But more than that, when you don't have the pleasure of Allah, your life becomes a misery. Ask those who sin. And I have sat and asked a few young people, even from among the non-Muslims, about their lives. And those who've told me, well, we work hard through the week, we earn, and come weekend, we go to the clubs, we enjoy, we spend what we have earned through the week, and we're ready for Monday morning. That's life. We party. We party during the weekend. And then I ask them, have you saved? No. Do you have a house? Yes, I do. Do you own it? Well, I'm just paying the bank loan. Do you have a car? Yes. Do you own it? Well, I'm just paying the loan. Everything I'm paying the loan, paying the loan. And on top of that, I'm taught that my life, I was born. Listen, these people think the following. They think I was born. I need to go to school. I need to earn. I need to party. I need to get bank loans. I need to get a house that I can't afford. I need to get a car that I can't afford. I need to pay those bank loans un until I can or until the day that they are paid off. And I keep on partying and I party until the day I die. And when I die, then what? Then what? Well, I led a life. It was a very nice, happy life. It was cool. I enjoyed. I had 20 girlfriends. I had 40 boyfriends. And you know what? I, I enjoyed life. I drank away. I partied all along. And that was really, I lived to the, to the full. Now you're not living anymore. Now what? You didn't think of it, did you? Well, I don't believe there is a hereafter. That's what they say. I don't believe there is a hereafter. How could you say that? Do you really think such a sophisticated being like humankind would actually just end when they die? I can die right here, right now. Do you really think that's my end? As sophisticated as we are? Never, not at all, it cannot be. I know I'm going somewhere. I know it has to be a better place. And I know I need to prepare for it. And one of the points of evidence of that is when you prepare for the hereafter, you actually have a much more peaceful life in this world. Remember that. When you prepare for the hereafter, you actually have a much more peaceful life in this world. So learn to fulfill what the Almighty has asked you to fulfill. My brothers and sisters, reach out to the non-Muslims. You are living in this beautiful country of Nigeria. You know the difficulties you are facing in your nation. What I'm asking you to do today is those whom you interact with or work with or come across who are not Muslim, reach out to them in a beautiful way. Let them learn what Islam is all about through your action, through your behavior, your manners, your etiquette, your honesty. That's how you will fulfill the right that they have over you. If someone has hated Islam because of your action, because of your words, because of how you swore in public, because of something evil you've done, Wallahi, you have to answer to Allah. You spoiled the name of a very beautiful faith. You distanced people who were interested in the deen from the deen. 
But if someone came closer to Allah because of you, have good news. The Prophet Muhammad says, Wallahi la an yahdi Allahu bika rajulan wahidan khayrul laka min humurin na'am. Wallahi for Allah to use you to guide one person is better for you than the most expensive conveyance on earth at the time, the red camel. So no matter who you are, be responsible. Fulfill your role as a Muslim. Understand your duty unto Allah. Understand your duty unto the rest of creation, your family members, your children, the other Muslims, the non-Muslims as well. Remember to greet one another as Muslimin. That salam is a duty. It's a duty. Subhanallah, when a person is sick and ill, pray for them. Try and visit them. When someone sneezes, respond to the sneeze. When they say, praise be to Allah, you say, may Allah have mercy upon you. These are duties that you have unto one another as Muslimin. When someone passes away, try and go to express your condolence and sympathies. Perhaps make dua for them. These are your duties amongst one another as Muslimin. The men can actually follow that janazah until the, the person is buried. It's your duty. Why? When you bury someone, you realize you are also going there very soon. So it softens you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. My brothers and sisters, I've been standing here for one hour. I might not have spoken for the whole hour, but Alhamdulillah, it's really been a beautiful time that I've had in this beautiful city of Kaduna. And I definitely would like to come back sometime soon by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if he brings us here again. And inshallah, I hope to see you again sometime. I know that perhaps I was distracted a few times during my talk. You saw it, you witnessed it. I'm sure you forgive me for that. But you understand I'm here for the sake of Allah. Allah is going to ask me and he's going to ask you. I need to prepare my answer. You need to prepare yours. So I'd like to hope that you can develop yourselves and I can develop myself as well. Become a better person, become a better Muslim, become closer to Allah, become a better daughter, a better son, a better wife, a better husband. Please become a better person for the sake of Allah. If you are a mother-in-law, father-in-law, become a better person. Try to understand the others. If you are a son-in-law, daughter-in-law, still the same we will tell you. Until we meet again sometime, we say, Sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad, Subhanallah wa bihamdih, Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant, Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.